네, 안녕하십니까. 2020 한겨레 부산 국제 심포지엄의 2일차 사회를 맡은 이미사입니다. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Misa Lee, moderating day two of the Hungary Busan International Symposium. I'd like to thank you once again for your presence at day two of our symposium. Today, we will begin our first session by inviting President Frank Zanussi of the Mass Beagle Foundation and Chancellor Kim of the Korea National Diplomatic Academy. They will be discussing Korea Peninsula Affairs and Northeast Asia Policy. Please welcome Chancellor Kim with a warm round of applause. Chancellor Kim is an expert in international politics of Northeast Asia, U.S.-China relations, and ROC-U.S. relations. He has also worked with the plan Policy Planning Committee under the President, and he has also worked as advisor to on diplomatic and security matters. President Zanussi of the Mansfield Foundation is an expert uh, in Korea Peninsula policy and U.S.-China relations. And he has also served as policy director of East Asian and Pacific Affairs at the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee. We will now invite Chancellor Kim to, to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I would like to thank you for inviting me to the Hangyore. Thank you very much. And I'm very honored to be an interviewer uh, in this great forum and timely forum. And and how are you, Frank? <laughs> Good to see you again. Great to see you. Yeah, yeah, we had a conversation before elections. Yeah, I have, I'm uh, witnessing you have a much more smile on your face. <laughs> Cause, yes, right? <laughs> You're happy. Actually, I'm happy for yes, you. Very, very relieved. Yes, yes, yes. It was really dramatic uh, elections. Um, and actually, I, I, today the CNN and this, this, uh, Biden is leading because 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 uh, uh, opening vote is still going on, more than 5.1 million and it is growing, and and we talked about this. You know, this is historic elections that can affect American way of life and as well as in the world. And Biden himself, President-elect Biden himself, called this his inflection point for America. So how do you see it? Can you, of course, you would like it, but yeah. Well, first of all, it's my great pleasure to join all of you virtually from Baltimore, Maryland. And I wish I were there with you in person, but I send my very uh, warmest greetings to everyone in South Korea and all my friends there. Uh, the United States is still processing the election. And although the states have not yet certified their votes, uh, the outcome is clear. And I will say that I think it is historic. Uh, we have had a very large turnout, uh, both for Vice President Biden and also for Donald Trump. More than 150 million votes have been cast. And the final margin will see Vice President Biden winning uh, by somewhere in the neighborhood of seven or eight million votes on the popular vote, and probably with 306 electoral votes, which is the same number that Donald Trump received in 2016. Uh, this election uh, really is important for the United States in that I believe it reflects a commitment uh, by the United States people uh, to rule of law, to uh, the international liberal democratic order, um, and frankly, uh, to truth and science uh, and integrity in public service. Uh, the Trump administration, uh, America first motto, uh, is one that was somewhat at odds with a commitment to liberal democratic multilateralism. And so I think the American people have chosen a future uh, which is more in line with uh, America's greatest contributions since the end of World War II. And I look forward uh, to a Biden administration 
uh, that will recommit itself uh, both to American allies, uh, but also to rule of law and uh, the international norms on human rights and democracy uh, that have been so beneficial, I think, uh, for the United States, but also for uh, obviously South Korea and for many of our partners around the world. Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, um, today is, we have a lot of questions and I want to see you in face soon. But here is the rumor that you came and key, low key here recently. Is that true and what's the purpose? So I did travel recently to South Korea on behalf of the Mansfield Foundation, not on behalf of the Biden campaign. You know, the Biden campaign, um, uh, uh, it accords to the traditional role of U.S. international uh, connections between campaigns and foreign countries. Uh, we have only one president at a time, and we have only one administration at a time. And so my trip to South Korea was on behalf of the Mansfield Foundation, which is deeply committed to U.S.-South Korea uh, cooperation and mutual understanding, and which runs many programs with South Korea, partly with support of the generous support of the Korea Foundation. Uh, so I want to thank the people of Korea for uh, the opportunity to travel to Korea, but it had nothing to do with the Biden campaign uh, and um, everything to do with the mission of the Mansfield Foundation, which I have led for the last six years. Okay, I trust you. And <laughs> you should have called me well, then. It's, it's, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, actually, uh, you know, you, you, have, uh, you are supposed to give uh, like an overview of the, uh, the situation, especially uh, U.S., Korea relations. Let me give you like a seven minutes overview about the, what's going to happen, what's the implication in this election's result. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I will be very brief because I really value the opportunity to speak with you and to engage in a conversation about the future of U.S. ROK relations and, and the future of the United States engagement in Northeast Asia. We've already, already touched a little bit on the election, uh, which has just been completed in the United States. Uh, it is historic. It is a significant accomplishment for Vice President Biden to defeat an incumbent president. Uh, it's always more difficult, to be honest, to beat an incumbent uh, who enjoys many advantages. And Vice President has done that uh, by the most decisive margin since 1932, when Franklin Roosevelt uh, defeated an uh, incumbent president. Hoover. So um, uh, the, the, the win is a very satisfying win for Democrats. But there's also a cautionary tale. Um, many millions of people, 72 million people, voted for President Trump. And this is why I think you saw in his speech last Saturday, uh, Vice President Biden made a very sincere and a very uh, uh, heartfelt uh, outreach to the nation. Um, in which he pledged to be a president for all Americans, and in which he encouraged his own party uh, to reach out to Republicans, to listen and to work to heal the nation and to hopefully unify the country uh, under his leadership. Uh, this will not be easy. There are many important issues which divide the Democratic and Republican parties, uh, immigration policy, health care policy, um, also uh, disputes about the future of climate change policy um, are just a few of the core differences uh, that separate the parties as, as a matter of policy. Uh, but I think that uh, President Biden uh, will be leading from the center and making a great effort to reach across the aisle, as he did when he was a Democratic senator, uh, to Republican colleagues to try to make common purpose on common interests. Of course, in Korea, you're most interested in what does this mean for U.S. foreign policy? Uh, there has been a lot of discussion about China. And uh, from my earliest days as a student in China in 1984, right through to the present, uh, the U.S.-China relationship has been a, one of the defining relationships of the 21st century. And the rise of China, uh, which has affected uh, 1.4 billion people, uh, is clearly one of the great strategic uh, events of our lifetimes. And now we have two powers, the United States and China, uh, which comprise nearly 40% of global GDP uh, and whose power 
is truly global and whose reach is global. Uh, and we should not expect this relationship to be one that is free from competition or free from rivalry. And I think it's very clear that the United States, uh, whether it's under President Biden or the previous president, President Trump, um, has a, a deep uh, concern that China is not playing by the rules. One of the things I've observed about uh, Senator Biden uh, is that his uh, career has been marked by three pillars with respect to U.S.-China relations. The first, uh, that he expects China to play by the rules, uh, that whether it's in the WTO or the rules of international nonproliferation uh, or, or on human rights norms, uh, that his expectation is that the emergence of China on the world stage is a good thing, but uh, that China should expect to be held accountable uh, for rule of law and international norms. The second is that on security issues, uh, Biden has a, a very low tolerance for anything that China might do that would threaten U.S. national security. When I traveled with him to China in 2001, uh, a lot of the discussions were about Iran and Chinese arms sales to Iran at that time, uh, which were of great concern to Senator Biden. And the third area of concern, of course, is human rights. And this is a matter of uh, global norms and, and standing with democratic countries uh, for the rights that are enumerated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And here, I, I just wanna be clear that my expectation is that if uh, uh, Biden speaks out on human rights, it's with a certain amount of humility because the United States has its own human rights problems. Uh, we are still struggling with issues of racial justice. We are still struggling uh, with issues of of equal rights for women and LGBT and the disabled. Um, and no nation is perfect on human rights. Uh, but I expect that Senator Biden will be a champion for those rights. And finally, uh, let me say a word about the USROK and DPRK relationships. It strikes me that Senator Biden in his Yon Hop uh, um, op-ed, which was published just a couple of days ago, made very clear his commitment to US ROK uh, Alliance. I witnessed this firsthand in the Blue House uh, when I, I traveled uh, with Biden to meet with Kim Dae-jung uh, and over lunch, uh, the two leaders had a deep conversation about what binds our two countries together. Uh, and of course, Biden even offered the hand of friendship and support to Kim Dae-jung when he was in exile uh, in the United States uh, as a democracy leader, activist, uh, in South Korean politics. So Biden has a long-standing commitment to the USROK alliance. Uh, he respects that it is the Korean peninsula, not the American peninsula, and that everything the United States tries to accomplish in Korea should be done in close consultation with the South Korean government. Uh, so I expect that that uh, pattern of behavior will very much continue uh, when he uh, is in the Oval Office. And finally, on North Korea, you know, I think there's a certain amount of admiration for the daring and for the courage and for the creativity that President Trump showed uh, when he reached out to North Korean leader Kim Jong-un uh, and arranged a summit meeting in Singapore. And I was among those who uh, praised President Trump for daring to reach out to the top level of the, of the North Korean leadership to try to convince North Korea that the United States could be a genuine partner in peace. Unfortunately, uh, President Trump did not prepare for that summit, nor did his administration ever create the necessary underpinnings, the necessary um, uh, hard work to, to reinforce this high-level diplomatic opening uh, with meaningful diplomatic engagement. And I think that uh, where President Biden and President Trump will differ is on their style of leadership. Uh, both are willing to engage North Korea. Biden knows there is no other pathway to peace on the Korean Peninsula other than through engagement uh, with North Korea. Uh, but he's not interest in a, interested in a photo op. Uh, Vice President Biden, uh, soon to be President Biden, uh, if he engages in a summit meeting, it's going to be to get stuff done. It's not going to be just to get it on the front pages of the newspaper or to get a nomination for a Nobel Prize. So I would expect that uh, a Biden administration will be very methodical, 
very careful uh, and very step-by-step uh, step in attempting to engage with North Korea in the pursuit of peace, uh, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, uh, and meaningful North-South uh, cooperation, peace, and normalization of relations. Uh, and in all of this, uh, Biden will be guided very much by the wishes of the South Korean people as expressed democratically through their leaders. Uh, because Biden is at heart a, a Democrat, not just a Democratic Party member, but a believer in democracy and rule of law. Uh, and he will listen carefully uh, to the South Korean leaders uh, as they explain to him uh, the path forward that they want to pursue uh, for peace and denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. I, I think I can stop there and I really look forward to your, your questions and having a dialogue with you. Okay, thank you very much. Actually, uh, it's, a ver uh, it's a very good summary, an overview of the uh, issue. And you touched three issues actually that, that are uh, the main core of the relationship between two countries. One is the issue of rise of China, and the second issue is alliance. The other issue is uh, North Korean nuclear issues. So uh, let me dig into uh, these three different issues. You know, there are, you know, big, you know, uh, right now it's big speculation and expectations because we are deep, we'll, we will be deeply affected by the new presidency in America. And especially uh, this um, nuclear and the alliance issue. And I, let me put aside that the China issue uh, at the end. There are, uh, you know, general evaluation or predictions among current experts here. Uh, Alliance-wise, the much better situation under Biden, because he said that he will recover and heal the alliance that damaged under President Trump. And almost everybody agrees, but some people said the North Korean issues and some speculation about one is, which is, I don't agree, but like a revival of, of the strategic patience. The second issue is because timing issues, you know, changing of government takes time and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, those things. So, and uh, we are kind of going to lo lose time. That's, and, and another one is, you know, President-elect Biden has so much homework domestically, and, you know, coronavirus and the economy. So one thing that Trump did best is this lifting this North Korean issue to the top priority. So we are afraid of the going back to the old days and those things. So what's your take on these issues? Thank you very much. It's a very good set of questions. And I fully appreciate why some in Seoul and across South Korea might have anxiety that there would be an opportunity lost. Um, Moon Jae-in government has, uh, uh, I don't know, I guess about 18 months or so. And there's an opportunity and a commitment by the South Korean government to try to make real progress in North-South relations and toward peace on the Korean Peninsula. And uh, the reassurance I can offer, even though I cannot speak for uh, the Biden campaign, uh, but just offering my own personal observations as someone who worked closely with Biden for 12 years, um, is that there has never been a U.S. president more knowledgeable, more prepared, more ready to start from day one in the conduct of American foreign policy than Joseph R. Biden, with the possible exception of George Herbert Walker Bush, who had also served, like Biden, as a vice president and who, unlike Biden, had also served as a head of the CIA. Biden has 36 years as a member of the Foreign Relations Committee, eight years as vice president. There's no learning on the job for Joe Biden. He will enter the Oval Office fully prepared from day one to engage in tough diplomatic activity around the world. Yes, he will be uh, very much focused on COVID and on economic recovery from the pandemic. There is no doubt about that. 
But we have a big government full of able people. And a Biden administration will be well staffed by experts, very knowledgeable, very experienced on the Korean Peninsula. And so I fully expect that there will be no delay, no need for lengthy policy reviews, uh, and no sense uh, that we should wait uh, or allow time to pass, uh, because time is not really our friend um, on the Korean Peninsula. Already the peninsula has been divided for 70 years. Uh, we need to make progress on peace and we need to do it now. Um, so uh, I, I think that there is also some misunderstanding about strategic patience. Um, it always confused me a little bit that patience was considered somehow to be a bad thing when dealing with North Korea. Uh, to me, when dealing with the North Korean challenges, patience is an asset and not a liability. What we don't want is neglect, neglect of the problem. That would be a, a big problem. That would be a big uh, liability for the United States. We should never neglect the North Korea challenge. Uh, but patience, I'm okay with patience. Uh, in fact, in my own meetings with North Korean officials, it requires a lot of patience. And I think they have a lot of patience with me. So um, uh, no one in South Korea should believe uh, that patience is the same as neglect. Uh, in fact, the Obama administration tried many times to engage with North Korea. And North Korea did not make it easy, whether it was uh, through nuclear tests or missile tests or the torpedoing of the Chunan or the shelling of Waipido. There were many obstacles that, that, that uh, confronted the Obama Biden administration as they tried to make progress on the Korean Peninsula. So I think much will depend on North Korea's actions, uh, but I am confident that as president, uh, Biden will waste no time uh, engaging with the South Korean leadership to devise a plan of action on how best to pursue diplomacy with North Korea. Uh, and I'm hopeful uh, that that effort will be undertaken swiftly and with great expertise. Yeah. Thank you very much. Actually, before I came to the stage, actually I talked to the, one of the organizers said it's 50 minutes a long time, but I disagree. And then I think probably I'm right. <laughs> I was right. <laughs> but anyways, uh, already half of the session passed. So from now on, I have a lot of questions, so it's a, it's I will a lot keep my of, yes, answers okay. more brief. <laughs> okay, and actually, I totally agree with you it's about the, his expertise. You know, uh, Biden's expertise himself, and at the same time, so many experts. And and unlike president who never listened to the scientists and experts, but I think Biden has an ear to listen to this as an expert. Uh, I think that's very fortunate, and and it's it's good. But here. You know, there are some concerns about the, 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 some people are still, you know, they actually disappointed, some people are disappointed, uh, you know, by uh, Trump, so uh, jump into the group there, and who still are very hardline positions against North Korea. And some people are really uh, support sanctions still. And those people, are uh, one group there, and uh, some people are, you know, step by step, flexible approach, and more realistic, just like you. And depending on the, you know, president's elect uh, selection or choose sides. So, what do you think about this? Well, of course, in Washington, we have a motto that policy is people, and people are policy and personnel decisions will matter. But what I know from experience working for Joseph Biden is that he listens carefully to uh, different points of view before reaching his own judgment. And he's got good judgment. So I think we should not fear a policy debate uh, between those who might have more of a arms control approach to the peninsula and those who might embrace a more East Asia centric approach between those who might prioritize denuclearization and those who might prioritize peace. Uh, the reality is that these are complex issues that are intertwined and uh, no unidimensional approach will ever succeed. We need to make progress on the denuclearization of the peninsula 
We also need to make progress on security and peace. We need to make progress on human rights and people to people. Uh, all three of these pathways for peace uh, are intertwined like a cable uh, or, or you know, my daughter's hair braided together. Um, and so we cannot unbraid them. Uh, we have to uh, uh, appreciate uh, that we have to work on all of these challenges simultaneously. And I don't know and I cannot predict um, exactly how a Biden administration will prioritize the tasks at hand. Uh, but I have a lot of confidence in his judgment, and I have a lot of confidence also in his ability to listen, not just to experts around him in the U.S. government, but also to listen to the South Korean government. I, I like to tell my friends that presidents actually speak uh, their own secret language uh, that is only available to leaders. So uh, Prime Minister Suga, uh, President Moon Jae-in, President Biden, uh, uh, you know, President Xi Jinping, they speak a special language. And, and they will listen to each other as they work together, hopefully, uh, to try to forge uh, uh, an effective approach uh, to engage North Korea. Let me give you one other uh, uh, supplementary questions. You know, usually you talked about the regionalist, you know, the Asian experts, and the functionalist arms control and things like that. You know, mostly, in other, other cases, usually regionalist is, uh, tends to be more moderate because they understand the reason. Right. And the functionalists you know, tend to be a more hardliner, but this Korea issue, North Korea issue is flipped in a way. <laughs> and these days, you know, arms control is more realistic because North Korea diversify their, their you know, nuclear capabilities. So it's not realistic to denuclearize at once, you know, as, as some hardliners argue. So in a way, Regarding North Korea, these Asian experts are the major part, but overall, this functionist has a main pillar of the U.S. nuclear policy. So how it is going to work out in, in your sense? Well, it, again, it's a very good question. And one of the things I try to communicate to my Korean friends is that they must remember that for the United States, uh, North Korea's denuclearization is not just a objective for peace and security in Northeast Asia, but it's also frankly integrated as part of a global non-proliferation arms control challenge. And while the Korean government is really focused like a laser on peace and stability and denuclearization of the peninsula, the United States necessarily uh, must uh, assess the situation on the peninsula in a global context. And this does complicate American decision making. Sometimes I've lamented, I've, I've found it regrettable that the United States cannot isolate the peninsula in our thinking because it might be a little easier to solve the equation if we did not have to consider how our approach to North Korea might send messages to Iran or to other uh, aspiring nuclear powers around the world. Uh, but of course we must. Um, so I hope that the arms controllers pragmatism uh, where they recognize that the process of denuclearization will take time, will be married to an East Asian specialist appreciation for the people to people, the historical challenges and, and the regional context of North Korea um, and how it fits together with China and South Korea and Japan and Russia. I, I hope that U.S. policy will reflect a harmonious integration of these interests. That's really the job of the National Security Council to try to bring all those disparate voices to the president, to integrate them and to present the president with rational uh, uh, policy options. And uh, I will make one partisan comment here, which is that President Trump was not very much interested in process. Uh, he felt that his voice and his brain were sufficient to set policy direction. And I think Biden is much more traditional in that he will encourage a policy process in the US government that brings expertise and policy options to the Oval Office 
for his consideration. Mm -hmm. And, and for Korea, I think that's a very, a very good thing. Uh, I think it will result in, in better, more sustainable policy. Yes. Yeah, we have a high ch you know, chance to go back to normal. It's, it's, uh, I'm happy for that. And anyways, um, uh, I got a, so many calls from reporters. And then I actually advised them, there, there's tendency here, to pick up, you know, that, that bashing North Korea, that statement you know, made by, you know, high officials or, you know, uh, high figures under the Biden camp, and they just collected it and, and look at that, don't expect too much, you know, though they are also hawkish, and then, you know, they just warned that the high expectation here, that's one thing I want to talk about. And the other way, you talked about that this arms control and more pragmatism actually is not really politically popular there because it looks like legitimizing North Korea. And this long-term plan then can, you know, give a chance North Korea to legitimize their possession of the bomb. So if you are, I, I'm maybe you will be in the post, then how are you going to overcome this kind of uh, uh, objections or resistance from, from there? Well, again, I thank you for the question. Um, speaking just as someone who has tried to uh, puzzle through the challenges on the peninsula, uh, it, it strikes me that uh, there is a real danger in the United States or South Korea ever uh, accepting North Korea as a nuclear weapons state. I don't think that is something we would ever want to do. And I don't think any U.S. president will ever uh, want to acknowledge North Korea, you know, as a legitimate uh, nuclear weapon state. The goal uh, must and should remain a denuclearized Korean peninsula. Uh, and how we get there is, is where the real debate will be. Um, and there are those who believe, like John Bolton, uh, that we should try to get there very rapidly in a kind of an overnight solution. And I think that those who have studied the problem closely believe that such an approach is not practical, even if it might politically be desirable. Uh, and so uh, that is why I think the United States, uh, working with South Korea, has been trying to devise a more realistic pathway toward the goal of complete uh, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, I wish I could tell you how long that would take. I have no idea. Uh, smart people like Siegfried Hecker from Los Alamos Nuclear Laboratories believes that we should uh, work on the most important issues first and, and, uh, and work our way through the list, uh, and that it might take years to, to finally accomplish uh, the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, and I trust Sig's judgment on this because he truly has studied it more closely than almost anyone I know. Uh, but the point you're getting at, I think, is the policy debate which will occur uh, in Washington, D.C., but is also going on right now in Seoul about um, what kind of a down payment the North should make in terms of proving their commitment to denuclearization and what we would be willing to provide in return. And that's the stuff that diplomats will argue about. You know, Biden told me once that it's the job of diplomats to turn the impossible into something that is just unlikely. So let's be honest. Uh, de if denuclearizing North Korea was easy, we would have done it a long time ago. Uh, it's hard. And let's also not sugarcoat uh, the nature of the North Korean government that we're dealing with. Uh, it is not a government that respects international norms on security, on human rights. Uh, it's a government that we have deep uh, differences with, and we should not pretend otherwise. Thank you very much. Actually, to I totally agree with you. But again, you know, taking realistic steps, you know, can be framed always, can be framed by the hardliners. Are you recognizing North Korean nuclear? And, and you know, step by step means that's the North Korean's approach. You know, they're on earned time and things like that. I think it's really will come.
You want to say something about that? I, well, I hear you, but, but what's interesting to me, I, I hear you very clearly, but it's interesting to me that the, the Democrats have not said to President Trump, you are recognizing North Korea as a nuclear weapon state when you sit down with him in Singapore without demanding any concrete steps toward denuclearization. Let's be blunt. We've been living with a nuclear armed North Korea for 14 years under both Democratic and Republican presidents. So, so you're not wrong. I, I agree with you that there will be uh, conservative critics who will always attack President Moon Jae-in or President Biden for a process of denuclearization, which takes time. But where have those critics been for the last 14 years where we have been living with a nuclear armed North Korea? Exactly, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, you know, here are the debates, what, you know, which is, <clears throat> Uh, a strong point about the top down of Trump administrations. And then for the past 30 years, actually, Democratic Party, you know, actually have run this bottom up approach and working level. <clears throat> Sorry about that again. And, mm, yes. you know, the Biden uh, president elect in the presidential debate, you know, the, the sentences about North Korea. You know, he called it Kim Jong-un thug. And actually, that actually draw a lot of attention here. See how he's a so firm about, uh, about Kim Jong-un. Mm. But i more, you know, on attentive about the, the second part. He said he would meet Kim Jong-un if, you know, Kim Jong-un does something. So that, I think that's good news for me, actually. But here... Again, this first part he called him thug is more uh, attention got attention. Another one is actually my my president Moon talked about this the top down and and the bottom up. Actually, you know all the times, you know working level, you know bottom up, but in a way never went up to the up. Started from the bottom, but Trump's problem is. They're talking about on the top, but never go down. That's the problem. So maybe we are thinking of combination, combine, you know, combine these two, combination of bottom up and and top down. So I think it's the, the best of the two. What do you think about that? I think you're very wise, and I think you should write a an op-ed about that. <laughs> no more addition. And and, and, well, and, and well, look, yeah. I. I, I think it requires both. I think it requires both. I, I mm. think that I, I have enough experience talking to North Korean officials to appreciate that they do not have a lot of maneuvering room. Mm. And um, at the same time, building trust, defining terms, defining objectives, um, narrowing the differences, um, identifying the key priorities, all of this needs to happen at the working level. But at some point, when you come to decision making, the North Korean system is very autocratic and top down. And if you don't engage with senior leaders, you're not going to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's really more about how to be catalytic and at what point you engage the senior leadership and with what objective. So uh, again, I don't think Trump was wrong to try a top down approach. I think that he failed because he did not build a foundation under his initiative. And if Biden attempts more of a bottom-up approach, but he fails to deliver a top-level engagement at the appropriate time, then his approach will also fail. So I, I think that your, uh, your wisdom here about the North Korean system uh, is something that not enough people in the United States fully appreciate, uh, that you need both a bottom-up and a top-down approach if you're going to get anywhere with North Korea. And I hope that, uh, uh, that this is something that will be uh, appreciated uh, by the Biden administration. I think I'm glad that when I heard, you know, Biden's comment uh, on that he's, he 
is willing to meet under the, some specific condition, and he didn't talk about the CVID. So you served him and advised him for a while, you know, at least a long time, in Foreign Relations Committee, so you know him very well. So I think he, he is going to uh, meet him if conditions are met. Well, I certainly hope so. And remember, it was Obama in 2008 who articulated the idea that a U.S. president should be willing to meet with the leader of North Korea if that meeting could yield a, a meaningful breakthrough in the relationship. And at the time, uh, Obama was criticized by many people in the Democratic Party who thought, well, you're legitimizing a dictator. You're legitimizing a nuclear power. And Obama uh, did not flinch. You know, he said, no, of course, we should be willing to meet uh, if that meeting can help to realize a significant progress uh, in, in the diplomatic uh, engagement. And I, I think that is uh, what Biden said he would do. Uh, and, and I can tell you, uh, having worked for him for many years, that he is a man of his word, uh, and he's very trustworthy, and he doesn't lie. So, uh, so if he says that's what he intends, he, he means it. Yeah, I really hope so. Actually, one of the contribution that, that President Trump made is, you know, he lowered the bar for symmetry. So I think we should take advantage of it. It doesn't, doesn't mean that we have to condone, you know, any provocation from the North. And that's, that's the, I think, the same context that Minister Kang said, we don't have to start from scratch. You know, we can start from what we have now. I think it's important. Uh, we have a, like a, uh, less than 10 minutes. Actually, I think you have a great talk about uh, an insightful comment on North Korea issue. Let me ask another, you know, the two, each question. So one, one question for each. One is alliance. Many people are very optimistic about alliance. Yeah, I agree with it. But is there anything that... Uh, can have a cause a problem. You know, I think SMA, you know, burden sharing is no problem. And, but one problem is, you know, always, this is related to China, US rivalry actually. You know, uh, Trump and the says kind of uh, not really officially demanding choose a side over the other. But the pressure yeah. was so <clears throat> high, like a quad or quad plus and EPN all that. You know, do you think this will be the same kind of pressure or the early euphoria and we're going to meet the reality later? What's your take on that? Well, it's a very good question. And my crystal ball is a little bit foggy in terms of making predictions. But let me just highlight one distinction. Where the Trump administration wanted to align like-minded countries, democracies, uh, market economies uh, in a virtual anti-China alliance. I believe that a Biden administration will seek to align those same like-minded countries in an alliance in defense of the liberal democratic order. There is a difference between whether the uh, efforts to uh, accomplish a kind of a unity of purpose is is oriented against China or whether it's oriented in favor of rule of law, IPR protection, security, human rights, democracy. And I don't think that Biden is very interested in having an anti-China policy. I think Biden is deeply committed intellectually, personally, um, and emotionally to the liberal democratic order that respects human rights, that respects democracy, that respects open markets, freedom of navigation, rule of law. So I do expect that the United States under President Biden would have high expectations for an ally like the Republic of Korea as a partner in defending that liberal democratic order against any enemies uh, wherever they might come from. But I don't think that President Biden 
uh, would ever want to try to assemble an anti-China coalition. Um, China is one-fifth of humanity. The United States has a lot of, of common interests with the people and the government of China with respect to making the world peaceful, prosperous, stable, healthy, um, and sustainable. So uh, it would be a huge mistake for the United States to embark on an anti-China crusade. And I don't think that the United States should be trying to enlist our allies and partners in such a uh, uh, tilting at windmills approach to foreign policy. Okay, we have five minutes and I'm going to ask a final question. This is related to Korea-Japan, ever worsening relationship. And actually, people are one side expecting that because Trump ignores this, but I think I'm sure President-elect Biden will do something about this. In a good way, yes, we need to improve our relationship. On the other side, we have the eight years, memory mm -hmm. of eight years of Obama in the ministry. Many people in Korea, especially progressives, are very disappointed at the time that more like U.S. and Japan has like a honeymoon relationship and a kind of pressure on those issues. So, and many Koreans are concerned about that many <clears throat> foreign policy experts and advisors who are expected to take a major post in the new government are considered more like pro-Japan. Is it a valid argument, you think? And, well, maybe and I please, should... Please give uh, your opinion about the, the relationship or, or the mediating role of the U.S. Go ahead. Well, thank you. And let me um, bring the conversation back to where you started when you asked the candid question about my visit to Korea a couple of weeks ago. Uh, one of the missions of the Mansfield Foundation is to promote cooperation between the United States and our friends and partners in East Asia. And one of the initiatives that we have underway right now is a trilateral U.S. ROK Japan legislative dialogue. And we had our most recent dialogue round just last night, a very productive dialogue, trilateral, uh, involving legislators of every party uh, across the political spectrum in the United States, in Japan, and in South Korea. And um, I believe the United States has a deep and abiding interest in the ability of ROK and Japan to work closely together on intelligence sharing, on trade, on defense of liberal democratic norms, IPR, human rights, democracy. And any time that South Korea and Japan are having difficulty working together, I think the United States should lend its good offices to try to encourage dialogue and problem solving. At the end of the day, it's up to the South Korean people and the Japanese people to manage their bilateral affairs. But the United States is not a disinterested party. Uh, we have profound interests at stake in Northeast Asian peace and stability. It affects everything about America's future, including our relationship with China. So I would hope that the United States would do what it can to lend their good offices, not to mediate or to try to, to uh, litigate uh, the difficulties between South Korea and Japan but simply to underscore the common interests that we share as liberal democracies uh, and to encourage both nations to work with each other to resolve all outstanding difficulties. Uh, I don't think that history can ever be forgotten, uh, nor should it be, uh, but I think we have to live in the future and not in the past. Uh, so I think that the Mansfield Foundation will do what it can to facilitate and to remind the people of South Korea and Japan that we have many common interests at stake, climate change, nuclear security, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, uh, and encouraging China to be a responsible stakeholder in the world. And uh, that was the purpose, frankly, of my visit to South Korea. Um, and it, I hope, will be a mission that the Mansfield Foundation can carry out in the future years. Um, and I really look forward to working with the people of South Korea, the government of South Korea, and the people and the government of Japan, uh, because the Mansfield Foundation is somewhat uniquely positioned by virtue of our deep connections to both countries uh, to encourage that kind of quiet, uh, mutually respectful uh, dialogue. 
And I was very encouraged by the conversation we had last night. And I was also equally encouraged uh, by the mission to Tokyo undertaken just in the last couple of days uh, by lawmakers from South Korea, also working to establish dialogue and channels of communication uh, between Seoul and Tokyo. Yeah, we are almost up. Uh, time is up, but I think we can squeeze one or two minutes. As to the last question, actually, always good to talk to you and all enlightening. Actually, this is you know, I'm, you know, like your first name. You're frank and honest. <laughs> and Try then, to be. yeah, because these days, you know, Korean, you know, congressmen and politicians are trying to contact and try to build a network with the Biden's camp, and then. I told them that's not now, you know, to not too fast, not too slow. And I'm sure that you have, uh, uh, you know, in the middle of the, so many calls and inviting. So any advice for them? Well, the advice I would offer is that um, Biden is what we call old school. Uh, he means uh, he only has one president in the United States at a time. Right now we have one president, Donald Trump. And so it would be inappropriate uh, for the Biden campaign to engage in any foreign policy uh, with foreign leaders. Um, I think messages of congratulation are always welcome. Um, I think that Biden has been heartened uh, to re have received so many warm messages of congratulations. And I believe that he had a conversation with President Moon Jae-in today, although I don't have, uh, or, or is it tomorrow? I don't have the details on that yet. Uh, but I know that that conversation is planned. Um, and my, my hope only to my, for my Korean friends is that they would uh, have some patience um, and understand okay. uh, that uh, until January 20th at noon, uh, the president of the United States uh, is named Donald J. Trump, um, and uh, uh, Biden will respect that. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, yes, I, I really... You know, we are happy to have you, you know, you know, very sincere, you know, the, the people like you. I think it's, it's my asset at the same time, you know, Republic of Korea's asset. So be there, you know, doing good things between these two countries. Always good to talk to you. And thank you for taking your valuable time. You know, keep in touch. Thank you very much. It's it's my great pleasure. Okay, Kamsamnida. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I wish you a very successful dialogue and conference. Okay. Bye. Kamsam. Yeah, Kamsamnida. Kamsamnida. Yes, that was a uh, very frank and passionate uh, conversation uh, to light the way to brighten the way for forward for Korea and for the uh, Korea-US alliance. Thank you very much. Uh, please send a big round of applause to both uh, Mr. Frank and also to Mr. Kim. With this, we'll wrap up uh, this session and take a 10-minute break to rearrange the stage for the next session, and then we'll resume uh, with session three.